Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, co-owner of the company Horns of Odin, and I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Matthias Nordvig. Hello, everybody. We are joined by Rolf Warmin, um, who is currently, who has just moved to Stockholm to do a PhD in maritime archaeology, but uh, has an MA in uh, prehistoric archaeology, uh, among other things, from the University of Copenhagen and has also been at the University of Southampton doing another MA. I'm sorry I didn't catch which one that was, <laughs> Rolf, but uh, I would love to hear more about that. And you are generally known as the weapons guy when it comes to, uh, well, the past. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, weapons guy, uh, also known as shield guy. The shield guy. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, just just something with uh, weaponry that's quite fascinating because uh, mm -hmm. they are like tools for for something people have visualized. This, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, they are. There is something very interesting about about weapons, and I think you might be unofficially the most mentioned person on this podcast without anybody actually mentioning your name <laughs> because Matthias has referenced your research on um shields so many times over the past episodes but we it took a little bit of digging to actually track down who the article was by in the end um and then as soon as we did we're like we need to book you on the show <laughs> exactly yeah your well, your your reputation precedes you <laughs> uh, yeah sometimes it's not a very good thing though you know no. <laughs> there's been uh there's, there's been many articles written about um uh, my research and some of it uh, is not so much based on on what i've actually written so i mean mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to vikings uh, it's something people feel very very strongly about that these things just have a way of yeah having it just has to has its own life in in the media yeah mm -hmm. yeah no especially that's popular, that's definitely true <laughs> uh, especially in popular culture it yeah things things grow their own life i think it was actually one of our one of our fans who who popped your article into our facebook group i think that's how it came about and we we found the origin of the the shield article that we were looking for yeah actually originally i had gotten it uh the information uh sort of like the, the very very brief headline version of uh of, of what you had done from a danish tv show on vikings or oh. something that had to do with vikings that was mentioning um your experimental archaeology project on all of this stuff like i can't remember it's actually several years ago so yeah maybe you 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 remember better what tv shows you've been talking to <laughs> uh, yeah but you know they uh they they have they always have their own twist of things and and of course experimental archaeology is always um the thing that's most like visually more, most interesting mm -hmm. for for the public but it's actually been like the least uh, or just well, um, no, I wouldn't say a, the small, but it's put been a minor part of the research because experimental archaeology is really about generating new results based on what you know already, and we we know quite a bit already if you just go into the into the sources and and and, and details. So okay, well, that's actually yeah. Let's 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 start there. What what do we know from the sources about the use of shields? Um, well, um, I mean. You would have to look for at, at the archaeology um, because that's way more sensible when we when we're looking at what sources are available because those written sources there's always some sort of um, you, you you have to be a little bit skeptic and uh, critical about reading those but when you have the the archaeological material okay that's it there that's that's what what there is and so. Uh, you can actually reconstruct the shields uh, pretty in a pre pretty decent way and get a get an idea of, of the design. And uh, so uh, I might just have to describe it in, in general for those people that don't know. But uh, the Viking Age round shield is is part of a long tradition, uh, which I've called the uh, Germanic flat round shield tradition, because it's something that starts way before the Viking Age from the early third century in Scandinavia. 
and then it lasts uh, through the Iron Age, uh, Viking Age, and in, into the Middle Ages. And then it's it's somewhat unclear when it ends. It seems to fusion with something we call the bucklers, which should be small sh- round shields. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has a very long long tradition. But during the Viking Age, uh, it was a, a a a round shield with a central handle that usually uh, would span across the bead the total diameter of the shield. There's some exceptions, of course. Um, it was thin, usually composed of maybe seven to nine planks, uh, and then covered with uh, some sort of uh, hide uh, product. Leather. How, how, how big was this uh, um, shield in terms of like covering the body? Like what could you expect for? Yeah, about uh, somewhere between 70 and 90 centimeters is, is probably a... a a good estimation of this, okay. um, but it's it's quite a large shield, um, but it's not an extremely large shield. So mm-hmm. I I would describe it as a multi-purpose shield, okay. which can be used then for um, defense against javelin throws or missile attacks, but also in close quarter combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, then later on, uh, there's lots of stuff happening with the weaponry technology. You get more armor heavy infantry and uh and then you get these specialized shields which which are then like bucklers mm-hmm. and uh, it, it, correct me if i'm wrong but the bucklers they're usually used with a some some sort of like a spear or or longer uh weapon right it it, it can be anything really okay. um yeah the the earliest uh, fencing manual that we have uh existed in in, in the world uh, the 133, which is in the at the Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds, uh, that's from the 1320s. There you have a buckler with very uh, and 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 a sword and okay. very specific details about how to use this in Latin mm-hmm. together. Okay. So it was the sort Just... of buckler mania. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For um, I guess for for people listening and and me, I like to hide behind, hide my silly questions behind pretending it's for everybody else um so buckler are they the are they the ones that are like a almost like a dinner plate size i guess that that seems to be on the hand i can only think of seeing them in gladiator um i'm sure someone has one in gladiator and they, they kind of they're they're almost like a, a small shield that looks like it's too small to be a shield why are you holding that silly small shield <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's something like that it looks very small and and in scandinavia mm-hmm. there's like um uh, just around the 12th century uh, or so, there seems to be uh, some sort of shield that lies between a buckler and a round shield. It's not quite a round shield, but it's not quite a buckler either. But um, so, so it seems to diminish in size at that point. That's but, interesting. Yeah, but there, there is a buckler mania uh, in the High Middle Ages, um, <laughs> and everyone are fencing with these uh, across Europe. So. I wouldn't say that it's the same tradition, but it seems to fusion with that here in Scandinavia, probably okay. because you had the existing technology here already, which was the, the round shield. Well, I, I'm curious about one thing, just going back to the origin of, of the, the, these round shields. Like, do, do we have any indication of why all of a sudden these Germanic slash Scandinavian tribes or whatever you want to call them start using these uh, shields? I, I assume that some of the first uh archaeological examples that we have of these are like Ilerop Odel and, and and such collections yeah it's, it's exactly that uh, Ilerop Odel is is the first or the earliest find of okay here uh why they start using that it's difficult to say um the ones before they are these uh, so-called Celtic shields uh yeah. that are more uh, rectangular uh, right yeah or we'll have a, like a long shape Mm-hmm. Um, which are known from your spring, for example, mm-hmm. uh, in Denmark. Um, but yeah, these these round shields, uh, maybe it's just their multi-purpose uh, uh, use that uh, that that's effective or deemed effective for that age. But at least it seems like the Germanic peoples across these many centuries they thought that it, it was a good sort of basic design. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Seems like the, there must be some reason to make it round, I guess, because if you were making a shield, surely it would be easier to make it square. 
Yeah, um, that's what I was I, fishing for. Is like what, but what what could could there be some kind of like, like, broader logic to it or or something? Shield yeah. wall. Shield, Shield wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they they're not. I wouldn't say so good for, for that sort of stuff, but um, but they're good for active use because it doesn't matter if you hold it uh, horizontally or vertically. You still have the same coverage. And you can you can use the shield um, active in that sense and still have mm -hmm. the same amount of protection. So if it uh, if it's long, then of course there's lots of gaps suddenly when you turn it. You don't have mm -hmm. the same problem with round shields. Okay. Ah, okay. So that 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 could be one suggestion or one interpretation. Yeah. We... So so and just for you know everybody who's listening who might not be totally clued in on 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 why it's so interesting to talk about these seals. Uh, I mean, one of the things that you're sort of known for having found out uh, possibly is that maybe these seals were not used for a shield wall. And as far as I understand your main claim in that is that, well, the seals would not actually have been able to withstand uh, the type of attack and pressure that would, you know, happen uh, on a shield wall like they would be too uh, frail for that i i i wouldn't say so uh, explicitly um, okay <laughs> that's my they, my bombastic interpretation um well it's it was also this was partially based on on one experiment we did with the best knowledge we had back then uh since then we've also made the most authentic shield possibly from uh, since the viking age uh, and that can actually with, withstand quite a bit. It still shows that uh, using it passively, uh, it, it gets a lot more damage than if you use it actively. But it can withstand quite quite a bit of damage, nonetheless. Okay. But that doesn't change the fact that the shield is held uh, in 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 a central handle, and it seems to be uh, uh, designed for a more active use than, for example a kite shield or something like that, which is strapped to the arm, um, or these convex shields, which mm -hmm. are meant to then cover your your body. Which and, would be and, like the typical Roman shield, right? Yeah, for example, something like that. Uh, or if you look at the late Viking Age, you, you see from the Bayeux tapestry, you have these kite shields. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those right. are like strapped to the, to the forearm as well. But that's not the case with round shields. Those you just hold by the handle. And there's actually, uh, some sources uh, from uh, from the uh, Icelandic sagas describing how you should remove like straps so you can so you don't get stuck in it. So it seems to have been used quite actively in that sense. Okay. There's also yeah. various descriptions or have you uh, have it at an oblique angle um, relative to your opponent, so you're not facing him flat on with your with the face of a shield, but at an angle, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be helpful in deflecting blows as well mm -hmm. um so there's that sort of active use too yeah you could i guess you could jab jab with it as well you could because it would hurt it's a big lump of big lump of wood um, yeah <laughs> what do um, we he... go on yeah yeah uh, um just to to build on that they they seem to be uh commonly understood like as a as a passive sort of weapon but yeah you can use them to, to hit people with. Mm -hmm. uh, I found one reference uh, also, it's it's a kenning, it's a sort of poetic description of a shield, but there it's called a uh, murder wheel. Which I thought oh, was... wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I'm going to start calling all shields. <laughs> murder so wheel. That, I mean, that would suggest that you are going to beat someone with it as well as... Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, if I was to have a shield, I think I would rather one that I could hold and then drop if I had to, rather than one that was kind of strapped and lumbered. So it seems like they were maybe made for for attacking on the move, um, which I guess would would well, kind of yeah fit that, with, that actually raiding. that begs the question that 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 Kim is uh, has thrown in the chat here is, is what Rolf thinks about the shields on the sides of the Viking ships. Um, and and their usage in that context, um, and I think this is how most people actually know about you know know these round shields, like any Viking ship replica or you know just you know, popular 
version of a Viking ship has those like round shields on them. So, so what's the deal with that? Like, can you can you give us a rundown of that? Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's it's very odd how how they they they're such an iconic element. The, these round shields, like they show up every, everywhere in the iconography and all, especially on ships, and we have them also described in various ways in in the saga literature. Um, but it's it's not a very good way of sailing with these shields on them and and, and rowing. Um, mm. And they've made some tests actually at the Viking ship museum in uh, Roskilde uh, with these. So it's it's really it's not very practical to have. Uh, unless, of course, you're just about to beach um, or uh, you're engaged in a naval battle, then it would make sense to put these shields up mm. as extra protection. Now, you have a description also of them in um, uh, Eric the Red saga uh, where, where they put them up. On uh, one of the ships recovered, uh, Viking ships then uh, recovered from Denmark uh, at Skuldelev, uh, Skuldelev 5 which is displayed at the Viking ship you see in the Roskilde. Uh, you have part of the rack or the list where you put these shields. Uh, so that's that's preserved on the ship. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, it, it's a real thing, but then the context where you would have used them, so that, that can be disputed. Oh, so, so would we know how, how they would actually hang on the side of the Ships. I always wondered that. You always like if you see like a little drawing of a of a, a Viking ship. There's the, the shields on the side. I'm like, well, yeah, but how are they there? How what are they? they <laughs> yeah, what are they in? Do we do we know? Like, did they have like little hooks to hang on? Did you have your name tag on it? Uh, like, how did it how did it work? Um, what what the what the, the tests I've seen and based on 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 that ship, for example, it just seems to have been enough that you you would put it in the rack. Uh, then it goes about halfway down, and then you can secure it with the handle uh, on the rope. Uh, oh, okay. And this also seems to have been how they were put in on the uh, Gokstad ship. Mm. Uh, and the Gokstad ship is, of course, a, a burial. Uh, it's a burial context, but the setup seems to have been the same. And uh, based on the excavation reports, this was an excavating in, in 1880, but there are some some detailed reports about how the shields were found in relation to the ship. And it, it seems that the, the weight of the mound has crashed in, uh, causing half of the shield to kind of collapse into the into the ship itself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, e even oh. there they seem, seem to have stuck to some somewhat the same principles. So I oh. guess you wouldn't have seen the whole ship from the outside like you do on pictures. You would see the top half of it and the bottom half would be kind of hidden by the the racking system. Yeah, that that's that sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful! So, what I mean, what do we know for sure about shields? I guess, like, what do we from the arch? You said about you know mainly on archaeology. What do we know? Have we found a full ship? A full ship? A full shield? Sorry, or I imagine that's a hard thing to get because it's all organic material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Returning to that question, I wasn't completely done. Actually, far from done. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, we'll, we're we're going to go all over the place because I, I this is a topic where I'm just going to get distracted and ask a bunch of different questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, what you find usually are shield bosses. Um, so so that's that's the the round metal part in in the middle. For those that don't know, that that's what survives mostly in the ground mm -hmm. for about a thousand years. Um, then nails and some sort of uh, metal fittings, which are rare uh, or more rare, at least they survive also sometimes. Um, but the organic parts, the, or, uh, the wood and the hide components, uh, they're usually gone, like far mm. gone. Yeah, it can be very difficult. So, uh, but some of the earliest, the earliest find that was the Goxted ship, which I mentioned, and uh, the remains. Uh, of 64 shields were found here. Um, and that kind of shaped the understanding of what a shield looks like. But that was then based on these early interpretations by Nikolai mm -hmm. Nikolaisen. Um, and, and, and there are some limits to, to, the, to the details he could look into there. 
um, so yeah, and then there was a uh, a, a round shield found in Denmark uh, recently in two thousand nine or ten, I think. Um, and there, most of the wood was preserved as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, other than that, uh, it's main, main, mainly fragments uh, yeah. that, that have been found. But some of these, um, then, then there's of course one shield outside of Scandinavia, but dating to the Viking Age, which is from Latvia, mm-hmm. and that's like the most well-preserved shield from prehistory, I would say. Um, so that's completely preserved with uh, wood and uh, two hide facings uh, shield boss which is uh, which is uh, of, of wood in this case um, but then it also has a layer of some sort of vegetable uh, vegetable layer in between um, probably some grass or something like that uh, so I'm having that analyzed soon um, but but there was what? this what would be the, the purpose of that? Um, I, I think it was some sort of um, a measure to, to, well, for extra padding, basically, take some of the okay. hits away. Like a little shock uh, absorber. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's, would... it's, it's quite odd. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, like, so when we think of, of modern human beings who watch a bunch of you know, movies that are, you know, highly fictionalized uh, versions of how, you know, a battle would take place and so on. I think it's, I think, you know, wrapping our head around how these weapons and guarding yourself from these weapons would work is, it can probably be a little difficult. I mean, for instance, what we usually see in, in, you know, know, fictional uh, depictions of, of battles from, from back then, right, is that somebody has a sword and, and shows up and then chops off somebody's head and then that's fine. And then that's definitely not how it went down, right? <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. you, that, that, that's a very sharp sword. <laughs> they can just do that. <laughs> true, true. Uh, and there's all sorts of interpretations. And I think also what we should be careful about is saying that there is such a thing as a Viking fighting style or a mm. medieval fighting. There were many, many mm. uh, different uh, kinds of people and approaches to warfare, uh, different fighting techniques. So uh, it, it's, and, and the, the material, the sources themselves are so uh, varied uh, mm. that I don't think there's any reason to expect that there was some sort of uh, unanimous approach to warfare at all. No. Right. I think, but, I think it's so easy and, and people fall into the trap all the time of trying to just assign singular things to the Viking age of like, this is how they thought of anything, the runes in, for, in general. Like, it's not that simple, you know, that you're talking a big geographical location and time, you know, three, four hundred years. So it's not just a case of one thing, one size fits all. Mm. Um, one, one more question I, I have on Shields before we, before we get distracted too far. Um, do you think there would be would, would like a I guess an army make just a, a bunch of generic sized shields and you would go and pick up a shield when you went to to battle or would you have your own shield? Do you think that was specific for you measurement wise? But I, I asked because I I tried to, I well I did make a shield whether I made it correctly or not I don't know but when I was reading they said something about how it should be your shield should be like elbow to wrist times two plus two inch or something like that. And, and I don't know where they got that from, um, but I wonder if there's any truth to it, I guess. No, there's, there's nothing that indicates uh, that or, or there's no evidence for it, but uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, I don't really have the answer. Um, <laughs> um, but it seems to have been a specialized crafts, uh, craftsmanship making the shield. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it was made by order. Um, but because it also, it's a question of getting the right materials for it as well. Um, 
yeah but it's, what, it's what wood to... would they use typically do do we have any indications of that i mean obviously we we don't have like a lot of, of wood <laughs> left from the the viking age but uh, uh th there are some some uh, that we know a little bit more about um mm -hmm. and uh because we can also analyze fragments right uh, so it seems to have been so that coniferous softwood uh that that was the most popular okay uh but there are even examples of oak oh uh, interesting yeah, yeah. and that must and, have been heavy though right yeah that, that probably would have been a little bit heavier um, mm -hmm. but it's not it's not that weird when you look at older periods uh in in the uh, in the iron age so uh, there's also oak and and uh, and hardwood so it depends really on what you have in the area i think yeah what's what's available i guess um yeah another another question i guess is do we know how heavy they would be um so it's just in the chat and i also want to because when i when i made my shield i fucked up um i i just i just thought well, i'm a big guy it'll be fine so i i could only get hold of 22 millimeter thick um i think it was a, a pine that i used so i made it to the dimension that it said um and it was 22 millimeter thick and the thing is fucking heavy like <laughs> I, can, I mean i can lift it i can hold it for five minutes or whatever but i wouldn't you couldn't do anything with it i wouldn't want to like fight with it um so yeah, I wouldn't like. Have, have you have you considered that it might just be your expectations then <laughs> that maybe they, maybe they did carry a bunch of heavy shit around when they fought? <laughs> I bought they, they, this thing's heavy. And I know I was just I, trying to put you down a little bit. <laughs> I know, I know, but I'm not I'm not a small human per se. Yeah. So it's it, I was surprised at how heavy it was, and I think the again. I'm guessing the the manual that I followed isn't the most accurate, um, but they said like 19 millimeter thick was the was the right thickness. Um, again, it seems like they probably was making this up for idiots like me who wanted to make a shield. But yeah, so I was like, oh, three mil extra, that's no problem. Well, apparently it it actually was. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it it makes it makes a huge difference. Like any sort of little weight that you can. That you can uh, shave off, then do that because it gets it gets heavy, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of stuff. Especially if you're using it for uh, longer periods of time. Um, so th I mean, th there's only one way to kind of test this to make sure that you have uh, that that you get an idea of how how uh, how heavy they will be, uh, and that's by making uh, some deconstructions. And uh, I've I've done my best to make an authentic one based on new data, uh, and we've done everything down to the smallest detail correct, uh, based on my own examinations uh, and uh, previous research. Um, and our lightest was uh, three point eight kilograms, uh, oh. so that's probably a fair estimate, I would say. Well, uh, that's. That's very light. Yeah. <laughs> this one I made is like 20 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, no wonder I'm struggling to lift the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this was, uh, yeah, and th there's there's people who would go for much, much lighter, like almost two kilograms or something like that. So there is a debate about it. Um, usually uh, this has, has to do with the way they train or the way they interpret training that then they make a shield that fits into that. So I, I went the other way around and I've just gone into the sources and with the new data. Uh, and that seems to be a reasonable weight, 3.8 about. That, that's so light. Yeah. yeah. I feel like and, I could and, throw and, that like Captain America. <laughs> yeah. And and the way you get that is by, by uh, uh, you get a lot of the weight away from shaving some of the wood. Uh, just just getting uh, getting it trimmed down at the edges for example um, so you can get quite a bit of weight and anything excess in iron and stuff like that uh, just remove it mm. so so it would be 
the planks would be thicker towards the center and and thinner towards the edges of the sword uh, will shield well yeah yeah so uh, it's it's probably it's not it's not inaccurate to say i, I think about one centimeter mm -hmm. uh, around the center and at least what i've observed on the uh, shields from gokstad is that there's an extremely complex way of tapering it so there's actually two two different tapering systems on on the shield towards the edge one starts about seven centimeters away from the edge and then uh, there's another one that starts about three cent two three centimeters from the edge so th it's actually something that they paid a lot of attention to mm -hmm. no that, makes, that makes a lot of sense probably is to get uh, rid of that that way because well, I guess, a, sorry, a, a direct strike would probably come to the middle because you would assume you'd be able to get it up and the edges would be kind of be coming down into the, the shield, like laterally, is that the right word? Does that make sense? That you would be coming like, down into it rather than uh, across adjacent, it. Adjacent, yeah. Adjacent. Yeah. Um, so, it's, I mean, it's, there, there's, some, there's some actually some theories about why it is like that. One is also that it's easier for the blade to sink into the shield to bite into it uh, mm -hmm. and then you there's ways of disarming the guy for, of for course yes yeah. so, so there are there are some references to that in the historical sources too so that's yeah. one interesting take another so you is, literally catch catch your opponent's weapon in your shield yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and, and it, it's actually quite detailed some of these descriptions how you rotate the shield and he loses his sword for example yeah um, yeah but this okay. is that, but that's that, that's like the game right with with the with these weapons and defensive uh, armor and so on it's it's constantly you know a, a it's like you you you're moving between what is most efficient in killing your opponent and and what is and how can you make your all this material that you're carrying lightest and strongest at the same time right so there's a lot more uh finesse really that goes with it right in in so yeah. many ways yeah in so many ways it's it's really like viking age round shields are are still per, uh, perceived as just simple you know uh, simple shields you know not the most complex of things but they pay like like with their ships they pay a lot of attention to the the, the resources they use and how they use the actual craftsmanship to shape these yeah mm -hmm. seems like everything's thought out because even then with you saying you know if something gets stuck in it you can twist it but that go that goes with what you said earlier about not being strapped to your arm because obviously if it's strapped to your arm you can't you can't twist the shield you can't rotate it 180 degrees whereas if you're just holding it yeah. you can um so it seems like the, the really thought about it i guess it's not just some barbaric round shield because that's all that they can make yeah it's so, some thought. and and one additional thing which which you get from tapering the side or, or the edges is you get a quite a balanced shield, and you don't have this extra weight at the ends, which uh, which make it difficult for you to maneuver with it. Of course, yeah, that makes sense. Um, broadening the conversation a little bit to, to more aspects of the defensive armor, um, what else? Like, if we were to sort of paint paint a picture of a of a Viking going into battle, what what would this person have been wearing otherwise? Um, because you know, uh, in popular fiction, what we see is, you know, this this weird armor and in, in Vikings that I'm just like, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> they always have the leather armor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just gonna mention it. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily describe them as leather wearing um, Vikings with mascara and tattoos and mohawks. <laughs> um, oh, uh, shattering our dreams here, man. <laughs> Uh, it depends entirely on what status, uh, what region they're from, what time period we're talking about, because um, uh, a Scandinavian warrior at the end of the Viking Age is def so much unlike uh, a warrior at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, usually we, we're talking about heavy infantry uh, at the end of the Viking Age, and these are the ones wearing uh, kite shields and uh, right. male armor and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and helmets and all all the gear right exactly yeah all yeah. the all the heavy infantry gear 
day nexus and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and begin, beginning of the Viking Age, well, uh, probably there were some heavy infantry uh, warriors as well, um, but it, it would be probably uh, more likely that you would have the use of light infantry troops um, in, in these early plunderings, for example, and a, a broad spectrum of, uh, of different kinds of people. Okay, so so basically, more of a ragtag army than than something more so streamlined and well organized. Yeah, that that could be one way to put it, at least for for some forces. Yeah. Uh, then there's some that were probably much more uh, uniform in 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 the gear. Yeah. So you, you, you can. I mean, you can't say for sure. No, they, they, I mean it's really interesting because what we see in the the early examples that we mentioned before, like Ilo of Odale, is like literally uh, like almost akin to going naked into battle. Like they're just wearing <laughs> wearing their flax clothing and then they have a shield and a spear and that's it, <laughs> really. Yeah, but but even in these uh, Roman Iron Age finds, it's it's amazing the amounts of uniformity in the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so there seems to have been so, so, some sort of standardization already there. Um, so it's not, it's not like uh, evolutionary linear progress. I mean, sometimes it's more uniform in certain regions, and sometimes it's just, you know, very different tribes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the, the best answer <laughs> I can give. I <laughs> right. That um, I mean, that goes along with uh, pretty much our podcast motto: "It's complicated." <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. It seems I guess they would they would have had different attire for for the circumstance as well because I guess if you were on a raiding mission you would probably want to be quick and lightweight whereas if it was a a war you would probably be heavier equipped. Am I, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, okay. And and depending of course on on what sort of uh, status you have, how much wealth you have, there's. Uh, at least in the Norwegian law text, there's also uh, laws about what you should have um, of of uh, of equipment depending on uh, where you are in the social hierarchy. Right. Yeah. So that also pays. Uh, I mean, what are the society's expectations to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I I'm, I'm going to pull this back to shields because I'm still not done with. Still not done with shields yet, and then we can <laughs> we can move on to everything else. Um, okay, back to back to my manual of shield making that I had there. It, well, I, I'm just going by. I, I think You're trying to figure best. out if you got scammed. That's what. Oh no, <laughs> I didn't pay. For, I, didn't, I didn't pay for the for the oh, manual, okay. <laughs> but I figured this is this is the best way we can kind of work through step by step of what's accurate and what's not. Um, so we have the shape, we have it tapered, which I didn't do, which is why it weighs so much the next thing was that they said put um like a leather front to it so you'd cover like the front in a in a leather and then wrap the circumference with rawhide but obviously you'd wet the rawhide nail it nail it in and when it dries it kind of pulls and binds all the shield together giving it extra strength is that accurate was that was that something that we that they would have done and and sorry to add on to that if if there is the leather on the front, what would be the the benefits to that to just having a plain wooden shield? Yeah, um, there's been so many uh, thoughts about what you should, you should cover the shield with. Uh, some very very early experiments they uh, they show that it should be covered with something because mm -hmm. uh, shooting it with bows and arrows. I um, mean, just splinters right away. So uh, the general imp interpretation has been it should be covered with leather or rawhide or gut. Um, but there's been no um, empirical evidence for any of those until uh, I, I launched a project together with the, the School of Conservation in Copenhagen, Moscow Museum and Aarhus University where we took samples of some of these uh, rare finds where, where the hide was preserved on, on, the, on the shields. 
And so we conducted uh, various microanalyses on these, uh, tested them also with the Yelp of SUMS, uh, which is a way of determining the animal species. And we got actually the results. Uh, so we now know exactly uh, what it was composed of. Uh, and the ones from the Viking Age, which we tested, one of them was from Birka in Sweden. Uh, there, the fa front facing uh, was tanned leather uh, of sheepskin and on the back. And then around the edge, it was also tanned uh, cow leather in this case. Hmm. But uh, this was actually a completely new method for determining, determining that sort of stuff because there is a, there's a vast difference between a rawhide uh, and leather uh, mm -hmm. parchment for that sake. So, um, and, and even in, in the archeolo archeological literature, it's uh, most often ignored and just called leather, everything. It's, everything's called leather. Uh, but it really was the plastic of the Viking Age uh, leather. You can make, do so many things with it. So it's a really important element. So uh, I would say that the rawhide on the edge, uh, at least based on what we have of evidence, that's wrong. Uh, and uh, then it would also most likely have to be covered on the back as well with the letter. Okay. Okay. Uh, but again, these are these are some rare finds, and there probably were uh, all sorts of ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's that's what the data says that we have now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I did watch a video when I was when I was making it, and and someone was testing kind of a a plain wooden shield and one wrapped with leather. And they, they did seem to be a huge difference when hit with an axe or a sword. The, the, the plain wooden one just kind of splintered and fell apart. And the leather did seem to really make a difference. Yeah. Um, there, there's, and and the, the, the leather itself, that can be uh, really um, interesting because it's it's made in it can be made in very various ways but the way we made it with traditional tanning with birch bark that gave it a really odd uh, quality so it's not it's not soft leather like you buy in the store in a modern store mm -hmm. but it has this kind of mushy um, quality to it so mm -hmm. when we conducted the experiments then uh, it's it, went very well together with the rest of the design because when you hit it or you attack it with a blade, uh, it partially absorbs some of the impact at first. And that causes, uh, that makes it very difficult to get a good blade alignment. And then there's a delay in that sort of uh, energy transfer. And so the shield starts rotating before you can actually get a good impact into the uh, materials. Hmm. So it's really, really uh, frustrating. We we hit it with uh, uh, two-handed axes as well, <laughs> uh, but the the letter really made a difference. Oh, that's that's so interesting. That, like, I mean, they it's really like a situation of these people having thought thought it everything out here, like in terms of you know creating the best defensive weapon as possible. Yeah, uh, and as I said, I mean, it's just. Uh, attention to uh, the source material you're dealing with mm -hmm. um so the it's 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 the plastic of, of the viking age uh, yeah. letter so and they probably knew a lot more about how to shape it and form it uh than than we do with with our techniques i was going to ask you one one thing um so for instance what we know about uh, the the ship construction is that they uh like they had a very specific way of, of creating the planks, right? They would not uh, break the, uh, what do you call that? The, um, the structure really of, of, of how yeah, the, the fibers. The fibers, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. Uh, so that, you know, it would be so much more agile, uh, the, the plank and the ship in general, right? Is that the same with the, uh, the shields? Yeah, it's exactly the same. So it's cleaved. Um, mm -hmm. and um, so not sword or anything. So you you preserve the best strength in it. Yeah. So, and, yeah, so, you, yeah. so you would go with the grain rather than a exactly. Yeah. Grain. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and not only that, but you also pay attention to what sort of timber you're using. So in, in the ones, uh, in the shield remains we have from uh, the earlier periods, we can see that it's actually, uh, it's slow grown timber. So um, the, the, uh, the grains are just maximum two millimeters apart. Okay. And that's, that's a huge difference uh, to just like uh, fast grown timber. Where so, so, so this is basically a situation where you would have some guy <laughs> who's like, who knows exactly what tree to go look for out there. Like, uh, yeah, or at least they know that it's slow grown or it's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's an old tree. Yeah, I'm just getting like this Mr. Miyagi kind of vibe <laughs> from that situation. <laughs> like, okay, but when I, like yeah, when I visited the the church in Norway, the Heddle Church, the Heddle Church, mm -hmm. Heddle Church, yes, and the, there was a, a guide that took us around, and he he was talking about how they would have planted trees like 30 years in advance. Does something know it is that was he just bullshitting me or is that something that we, we can, that just reminded me of it then when you were saying about the slow grown timber that the, they would kind of plan ahead and, and would they have like a little area they would farm from and uh, cultivation uh, yeah there, there's been attempts of, of, of locating or, or proving that but there seems to have been some some sort of cultivation at least of um, of trees yeah I mean it doesn't that that doesn't surprise me that much um i mean like there's been cultivation of various trees and plants uh, across europe for a, for a millennium a millennia so to, sorry uh at that point so yeah that makes sense yeah. no but i guess knowing not because if you planted a tree and you knew that in 30 years it was going to be useful for somebody making a shield you're almost certainly not planting that tree for yourself you're you're very much thinking of the next person that that comes along and what's to stop you obviously know not to cut it down after five ten years when I mean, you still could probably use the wood to to make something from so it's very much a, a foresight of knowing the best wood yeah and uh i would say also a certain a, a certain uh, dedication to your society or culture mm -hmm. But I, I can also give a, a, an interesting example um, that uh, Danish people would probably know about when uh, the Brits, they came and they took all the Danish naval vessels uh, in 1807. Um, then the Danes, they uh, planted new trees to build new ships. And so in the 2000s, um, then uh, the trees were ready. Uh, <laughs> and so they sent... They sent a, a message to the government that now, now the trees are ready for building new ships. <laughs> you can come back and yeah. you can was, get us. They, yeah, I think it was in 2007, the Danish Forest Service uh, called up the, the Navy and was like, your trees are ready, boys. <laughs> oh, wow. I wonder if they still had to pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you want to get paid if you've been growing the trees for that long. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> 200 years of waiting <laughs> I mean, hey man at least we can build a fleet the same size now <laughs> <laughs> no but it does it shows the the foresight you know thinking thinking ahead thinking of the next person which we unfortunately don't do so much these days um so it's nice to nice to see so is there anything else we need to know about shields before we move on to other weapons I particularly want to see if you know any horror stories from weapons because you told me earlier about the the crossbow that I have here. How apparently it's some people they used to snap on and crush the heads. So I want to know more things like that. Well, I can tell you some horror stories about shields. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, there's always some good stories about that. Um, but there are, of course, references to uh, to these shield biting uh, berserkers. Um, yeah, and, and there's also some some that are quite a mocking berserkers a little bit, or half berserkers, kind of wannabe berserkers. And so uh, there's an account where where one one of these 
uh, people is piping a shield like as like a berserker would. And uh, then another guy just kicks the shield up into his teeth, so it breaks his jaw. <laughs> oh. That that sounds like when when somebody's having a drink out of a bottle, and there's always that asshole that like hits the bottle at the bottom and it cracks the tooth. I've seen that on like Instagram, those Instagram videos, and that feels like the the laddie thing to do back in the day. You've got that one mate who's like fucking kicks it, doesn't think about it, and. You've got I, I I love this. this. This is a perfect mental image for me. Is like that 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 asshole who thinks he's so fucking cool. He's just coming here biting his shield and he just kick it right up in his face. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and this whole shield biting is also quite weird because I think um, at least in in the uh, in the Iron Age there's there's uh, also paint on the shields which are actually toxic, like uh, cinnabar, which is like quicksilver. Uh, mixed uh, red paint, and so I'm wondering if they would ever bite into that sort of stuff. Uh, oh, maybe that's where the madness comes from, then. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Mad Hatter syndrome, right? Well, that, yeah, that, that that's what I was just thinking. It could be a similar thing, I guess, if it was toxic and they were, yeah. I mean, but how, how I... quick would it, how many times would you have to bite it for it to have an effect? Maybe? I, I, I think you just die. <laughs> I haven't tested it myself, but um, uh, yeah, the whole berserker thing. There's a very interesting, uh, well, rec- recent in archaeological terms. Uh, there's a recent PhD um, dissertation written by Robert Dale on berserkers, mm. and so he has a new interpretation of uh, what this co- co- uh, kind of frenzy is. Um, and he he's also compared it to what what do you call it um, uh, haka uh, this sort of right. performance yeah yeah uh, so oh, we you, you I would say we actually we actually had him had him on the show to talk about talk about that so yeah we, uh-huh. uh, we did an episode with him was it late last year yeah um, yeah sometime in the fall yeah so anybody yeah. that wants to listen to that you can go back and kind of scroll through our back catalog and, and find that with, with Roderick Dale. Um, Roderick Dale, yeah. Roderick, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I can highly recommend the dissertation as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Everybody should read that. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a new interpretation of Berserkers, which I think deserves a lot more attention. Yeah, I very much agree with that. No, they were definitely fun episodes. And I, pr- I probably tend to agree with him that it, like a warrior dance mm-hmm. would be, it would make sense, just hy- hyping everyone up. Um, okay, any more any more shield horror stories? I guess before we uh, there's plenty, but we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Mateus, is there anything you wanna you wanna move to? I mean, I, I I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how widespread are swords as opposed to axes, and you know various kinds of of. Of um, um, de- offensive weaponry in in the Viking Age, like uh, what is your take on that? How widespread it is? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, for instance, one of the things that I I think you know, first of all, the Dane axe is very often associated heavily with the Vikings, and you also have the smaller axes that are associated with you know, this is what Vikings use. Um, so then over time, you've also seen. Uh, Viking warriors represented as uh, people who were carrying swords all the time, and so on. So, it's like, what what is your take on all this? Like, what what uh, what should we expect from a from a, a Viking attack? What would their weapons have uh, been? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, again, this depends very much on on the time period and people and uh, uh, all the social constraints that that society uh, is acting under. And these constraints can be technological, economic, or just ideological as well. Um, all these things they they play uh, play a role in it. Um, but generally speaking, uh, Dane axes, which they are relatively well known for, that came at the very end of the Viking Age, or it seems to appear around 950 AD mm-hmm. thereabouts. One of the one of the earliest examples, uh, I think, is actually uh, this uh, Birka, so-called Birka warrior woman, uh, mm-hmm. which has received a lot of media attention. 
Um, so I think I should mention her since it's International Women's Day. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. So uh, yeah, it's 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 an in- interesting burial. Um, I think we should go away from calling, or we have actually moved away from calling these sorts of graves warrior graves. Uh, we call them burial graves, which is the more correct term, uh, since you just need another layer of interpretation on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, she she ha- she's buried in one of these uh, day nexus, and it's one of the earliest, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for people listening and. Again, for me, um, <laughs> what's what's a Danax? What would constitute a Danax? Uh, and again, if it, with her being buried with one, is it purely an offensive weapon, or could it be used as a, a tool around the farm for for chopping wood? Yeah, the the, the great thing about the Danax is that there we're really talking about uh, a, a a killing axe, uh, not a tool axe. Or we can be certain that it's a, it's a, it's a weapon. It's really thin. Uh, it's about it could be about five hundred grams in weight. Uh, but it, it's just made for for killing. And it, of course, it's not. Uh, it's going to be very heavy to go with a with a tool axe. But pre- people have probably had these multi-purpose axes in in battle, uh, and some that are more, maybe a little, little bit less like tool axes. Um, there's also some smaller axes. Uh, which probably could be interpreted as uh, battle axes as well. But the Dane axe, uh, there's no question about it. When you find one of those, okay, then you know it's it's a battle axe. And it's used with then two hands uh, based on uh, iconography and the available archaeological data where the uh, shaft is preserved. Then uh, it seems to have been on a relatively short shaft of like 90 centimeters so it's not like these three meter long axes that you usually see in uh, re- reenactments uh, mm. circles or something mm. like that yeah they like, always that's what i was wondering they always seem to have a really long handle whenever i see yeah. things. what what about shape of the of the head um it's it has these um uh, it's 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 pretty broad as a broad blade um and then the edges uh, can go out to what they call horns, uh, but it c- becomes more prominent later on. Uh, mm-hmm. So it goes through various stages of development also during the Viking Age. And then uh, it's also used later in what we call Denmark than the, the, the Middle Ages. We, this, this is what in, in the old Nordic languages is called a skeker, right? The, the beard, basically. It's, um, like, that, for that, instance, in Danish, we have plaske. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the bottom part, but then you also have this top part, which can be right. used uh, for stabbing as well. Yeah. So it's a really nasty kind of multi-purpose battle axe for yeah. chopping and stabbing and pulling. So yeah. uh, some of the Icelandic sangas also describe how you how you pull the leg from behind. Uh, for example, if, if you miss targets, or or uh, there's another account describing how you uh, you pull it and, and it gets stuck in the back of the opponent's neck. You pull them towards you, and then your friends can stab mm-hmm. them with all yeah. sorts of nasty okay. things. You okay. can also use it to pull down a shield, going back to the shield, right? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah, it's very useful. That's what sort of context too. Yeah. Okay, I I thought a, a bearded axe and a day axe were different in shape, um, but I could be completely wrong which i usually am <laughs> but but i thought i thought a day and axe was like an uneven fan i guess just like a fan shape but i guess they like want the bottom size a bit longer than the top but it kind of was like yeah. that kind of shape and yeah, then, but exactly. then the beard exactly. but the beard axe was had like a, a was pretty flat at the top and then like that yes like the one on the right there mm-hmm. yes so exactly. this, this one with me had like a very prominent beard but i thought the the day and axe kind of this was kind of the same down but uh, is that is that wrong have i just been wrong about that all this time? no that that sounds uh, like a good description um so it has these um parts extending in both directions the day night stuff mm. yeah so like like you would get the top part that's a smooth curve up the bottom was like a smooth curve down as well yeah whereas the beard axe has like a very prominent 
I guess Lots beard because he's called a because he's called a beard, <laughs> and you can hook. Um, with with like the with the beard axe earlier, were they were they used kind of that that was earlier, yeah. Uh, but uh, it continues on uh, during the Viking Age, um, and there's various types as well. Of those. Mm. So so. Um... You know, speaking in very general terms about, uh, uh, you know, what kind of weaponry they would have based off of, well, for instance, such things as the economy of, of the individual, the society, uh, locations, you know, all that stuff. Um, mm. One thing that I have read about uh, swords is that they become more prominent through the Viking Age um and also that the quality goes down um is is this something you can confirm in in terms of uh, sword usage among vikings um par partly uh, i mean there's also evidence of some swords uh having what would you call more of a status role Still functional, mm -hmm. but more of a status role because they really want maybe a fine inlay in it, something like that. Um, but gen generally speaking, uh, then the, the sword would belong to the higher levels uh, of society, being a much more expensive item. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And then there's various, uh, of course, various um, levels of that too. Um, so it's, it's a very fine. Uh, craftsmanship mm -hmm. uh, many of the finer blades they would then be imported from uh, from uh, modern day France uh, Germany mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, it's interesting because you know sometimes in popular culture you you get people who who definitely have like the wishful thinking about vikings that uh, they had sort of like samurai kind of swords you know <laughs> like mm -hmm. that, that they people who want to mix that idea into it and uh, i don't think that that's exactly the picture that we're seeing <laughs> no no then there are of course some that are very fine quality like uh, mm -hmm. very homogenous uh steel and of course there's the ulfbert swords uh, uh w which are quite uh, well known um, but but uh, yeah, I mean the quality varies uh, immensely. But there's still lots of studies to be made on this. Um, there's new techniques now, uh, so hopefully we'll see a lot more studies into it. But previously, uh, you've had to do these destructive uh, analyses to take samples out of these artifacts, which is not really so good for for the artifacts themselves. No, right. Yeah. So the Ulfbert swords. Now, every few months, a little meme comes up on Facebook saying how these swords were made using some technique that they didn't know about and they're far ahead of their times and whatever other bullshit you see. Um, it, uh, were these swords that amazing? Or, or I think Matthias spoke before like that maybe they weren't particularly that good or there was a lot of copies um, yeah, it seems like this sword, for some reason, has caught on in people's imagination as some legendary sword that's... So I think some people are like, they're still sharp now, the ones that they've found. Um, <laughs> and that kind of, these kind of claims you see thrown about very wildly. Um, yes, it's... Uh, it's, it's uh, I won't say I'm an expert on it. There's uh, people who are a, a, a lot more knowledgeable about, about this sort of thing than me. Especially, I would say, uh, blacksmiths, uh, they know this a lot more because you really have to go into the details of what, uh, what, these, are, what these consist of. Uh, but if you're looking at Ulfbert swords, uh, they seem to, um, at least many of them, have this very hard, high carbon uh, percentage in them and very homogeneous uh, material. And that's what makes them uh, so exceptional compared to many of the other swords. Uh, but even within those that are called Ulfbert and are spelt in the right right way that are not forgeries, there's also some variation. So I wouldn't say that they're these fantastic legend swords, but uh, some of them are extremely high quality and some that you don't see many other places. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Mm. 
do you with something I guess like you said you're not really an expert in but I can't help but but think do you do you think that the ones that have like the high carbon content it's by accident or do they know what they can you do that I, I'm I, can you do that by accident or do you do you think they're specifically aiming for that because they know that's kind of like the sweet spot for you that's probably something that's done intentionally when it comes to this sort of um blacksmithing then you really need to know what what you're doing mm-hmm. um otherwise just the the, the wrong um uh, carbon percentage can can mess it up and it can become brittle and that's what you don't want with, with some of these source so so um ali is asking in the chat if if, if this is like uh if they're using the damascene uh, technique or uh, metallurgy technique on i don't know how you say that in english really <laughs> but uh, is, is that what we're talking about here or 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 is it, it is um that... no there there's some people usually use that word um there's some um issues with the terminology uh, okay. so I, I don't want to go too much into that um so i i've I'd rather not <laughs> like, I <laughs> one, because I know I'm going to have some black space that are going to contact me afterwards and say, that's okay. not what it is. <laughs> but do you, do you, okay. Do you know anybody who specializes in these sorts? And then we can contact um, them and see if we can get them. I, I had a, a good uh, collaboration with a blacksmith Thor Bergelin um, in Sweden from Thor's Forge, who makes axes and swords. So he's also uh, done various experiments with these sort of Ulfbert type ones and he has some quite interesting ideas there um then uh, there is of course uh, peter jonsson also a very well-known swordsmith but okay. i i would really talk to to the people who who make these sorts of things uh mm-hmm. who who know the craftsmanship behind it sure yeah we will uh we will contact you for uh, for uh yeah. details of those guys yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. um <laughs> Yeah, so so I guess in popular kind of culture TV shows, whatever, it's the axe. The axe is very prominent with with Viking iconography. They they're always carrying this this axe. The the throwing the axe. Um, mm. For firstly, like was the throwing of the axe ever a thing? Do we know any kind of example, any evidence that that happened? Um, and then the other thing was like, was the axe really? the primary weapon is that like the go-to thing why would you throw away your weapon i was <laughs> just thinking that. it's like sounds like a bad idea yeah. um, <laughs> because it looks yeah. really cool when it goes well and the guy <laughs> flies back like in vikings you know he, he gets hit with the axe he, he falls back he's dead <laughs> nobody else comes and attacks you whilst you're whilst you're going over there and picking up your accident yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, but it, it seems to come in the wrong order, though, because, um, uh, well, I, I asked the question of why would you throw away your weapon? Well, spears and stuff you can throw at your opponent, then, t- then you can grab um, a close quarter weapon, like a sword or an axe. And so I, I'm not aware of any descriptions of axe uh, throwing, uh, but there are some descriptions of an axe being hidden behind like a, like a shield. And then you yeah. can grab it. Um, right. So there's stuff like that, but not of any a, throwing axes. I'm afraid you've got a backup axe. Yeah, no, that I, makes perfect sense to 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 keep an extra weapon in there, right? Um, yeah, I and mean, the smaller I, axes would per, be I, perfect for that. I yeah. heard, I heard the axe story comes from lumberjacks, and whether this is true or not, I don't know. But apparently, it comes from lumberjacks when they used to have to pull things. Like maybe this back before machinery would fell a tree, and they'd have to like carry it out. So they throw the axe from tree to tree, so they could use both mm. hands to to move and and have maneuverability a bit easier. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's kind of what I read. I might have butchered my my memory of that. But it was <laughs> something to do with that, and it's not just like the axe throwing comes from like you know stereotype European descriptions of. Native Americans throwing tomahawks everywhere, and then we applied that to the, the Vikings in the TV show. I don't, I don't know, but it's, I don't, I, I just remember read like reading it 
at some point when I was going down a rabbit hole of wanting to know about axe throwing because I'm an obsessive, <laughs> I'm an obsessive maniac. And if I put my mind to it, I'm like, oh, I want to throw axes now. Let's research everything about axe throwing. I mean, but it looks cool. It, exactly. But- it looks cool. And, you know, you can, you can get the, I'm pretty sure plenty of dudes throughout time have gotten the idea, hey, let me try to throw this axe in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not it was in battle, that's another matter. But speaking of axes and um, the, the various uh, or, or, or the economy, uh, there's always this tendency to think of axes as just very cheap weapons. Uh, and of course, they could be. Um, I mean, it's cheaper to have an axe uh, than to have a sword made, just a lump of iron on a stick. Uh, mm-hmm. So a spear or an axe is just fine. You can take uh, your working axe and maybe use that as well. But then in the 10th century, there seems to have come also a certain status connected to axes. And some of these axes are very, very fine and uh, are, can be decorated with silver and um, all sorts of other stuff. So uh, it seems to have gotten some sort of status at least then. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and I guess, uh, are we seeing particularly good uh, iron quality coming from Scandinavia in general in this time period anyway? Uh, better than in Japan. <laughs> better than, okay. <laughs> so, so that's I mean, uh, well, you, you, there's always this thing with, you know, a samurai sword, and but that's just because it has to be folded so many times. You know, mm-hmm. so that's very fine. But, but uh, it's also, uh, we have much better quality of iron uh, here. Oh. So it, it doesn't na- need the same treatments to get the uh, impurities away. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, th- th- that's, that's the type of iron that you're getting from the bogs that you're saying is better quality? Um, for the axis? Uh, well, yeah, uh, here my lack of knowledge of where the iron for those axes come or for the axis swords come from. Uh, okay. Yes, but 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 it's it's quite it's an it's it's a, a quite an okay quality at least for uh, for bosses at least. Okay. Yeah. Um, the problem with some of bog iron is that uh, there can be some purities, or it, it can be very hard to get a some homogeneous material out of it mm-hmm. and uh, impurities in it. So. Um, and that that's sort of like the standard stereotypes. Uh, 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 information i think you kind of get from uh when you're digging into it at least in, in a scandinavian context is like that the bog iron that the scandinavians had at the time period was kind of shitty so that's why they gravitated to getting you know source from france instead and, and that, that kind of stuff but maybe that's uh, not as, as it's also about mm-hmm. what uh technology you have available because mm-hmm. it does take uh, quite a large uh deal of skill to, to make like good swords and uh, in that sense. Uh, uh, one-edged like swords, CXs, uh, there's no problem with making those here in, the, uh, in Scandinavia. And they've done that for, for many centuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's also a, a simpler sort of geometry than uh, these double-edged swords. Right, oh. that so makes sense. Were they, were they close quarter weapons or were they just tools say axes um you have to go a little bit further back in time to look at them uh so if you go into germanic iron age there's no question about it that they these are like weapons and you have everything from small CXs, uh sacks uh and, and they grow uh, in the course of the germanic iron age into long long weapons some of these are like one meter long, uh, have, single edged. I would say I have a replica of the 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 one in the Thames. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's fucking huge. <laughs> they they so can't like cool one. Huge, yeah. That's a that's a sword. That's but that's exactly. what maybe seven hundred millimeters long, seventy centimeters, which is a long thing. That's why I was wondering whether it was like yeah. a. A sword yeah. or a knife. Or it's somewhere a... in between, probably. Uh, that looks like a sword to me. So <laughs> that it, yeah, it does. 
Yeah. And if you put two of them together, it's scissors. <laughs> oh, I guess. Yes. Hence, hence the name. Hence the name. <laughs> is that is that true? Yes. <laughs> oh. No. no? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, but in Norway, uh, those, those in the Viking Age, those long uh, single-edged swords are uh, more popular, um, it, at least in the beginning of the Viking Age. Uh, and there, it looks like the same ones uh, as in the Germanic Iron Age, the end of it, but it now has these um, the, the sword hilt to it. So it's like a proper sword, just single-edged. Um, mm. And those, those were weapons, uh, no doubt. Yes. And just for reference, the word scissors in English comes from Old French, and it's just derived from the Latin word for cutting. I knew that. I was just playing along. <laughs> 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 All right. Before before we wrap up, um, do you have any interest in, I want to know more horror stories <laughs> regarding like axes, swords, any cool kind of little bit of information. Of, I know we we. We know of the, the Repton man who got his dick cut off somehow. Yes. Um, anything like that. Cool, poor, cool. poor Viking on Fuin in Denmark who got his dick cut off or, or, or you know, ended his days in a similar manner as, as, the, as the guy from Repton. <laughs> Maybe it was the same. What if it was the same guy who did it to both? Like that was just his MO. I, I just... think actually there, there is some kind of relationship, um, maybe not with the guy in Repton, but uh, but there's a there's a uh, familial relationship between the guy who died in 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 Fune and and some his cousin or brother or something in in uh, in England. They're it's just filed one... teeth guys. I, I can't remember the story correctly. There's <laughs> one bastard Saxon just out there cutting off Viking dicks. <laughs> like that was that was his thing when he went to battle. <laughs> And you had, like a little, you had one of those necklaces that you sometimes see with like ears or teeth on. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, really nothing like, uh, or, or, or nothing compared to what you find from the Mesolithic period, uh, where you have uh, of some. <laughs> uh, you have, well, you you think of uh, farmer cultures as being quite peaceful. Uh, but you have the first culture that's coming into continental Europe is called the Linea Ban Keramikultur, which mm -hmm. are this farmer society uh, go into Belgium and France and so on, where you have hunter gatherers. Um, and so what you find there are sometimes these mass graves. And uh, one in one place um, in, uh, in Talheim, you have also uh, these nests two nests of like skulls that had been placed there uh, as, as if it was like a bird nest. And there's like over 30 individuals that have been gotten a, 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 a hit to the back of the head. So that is quite a, quite a gruesome scenario. Yeah, just so, so, they, so they decapitated everybody and then just put it put in, their, a, in a nest. Put their heads together. Yeah. So people well, have been I'm... very nasty towards each other for a very long time. Yeah, I mean the Gauls in in what is now France, right? They they, they had a tendency to build build towers of of the skulls of their enemies, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, very, the... very nasty stuff. Yeah. People yeah. aren't very nice, are they? Sometimes. And I mean, um... we do also have, if I remember correctly, we do have a couple of. Uh, skulls and other bones from you know, danish sites uh from the neolithic period i think it is where they've yes. definitely been eating them right uh there's there's at least some um uh what, what, would, what do you call it uh hindrances um executions. Oh, executions yeah yeah um and it just seems to be a lot more a lot more violent place after the neolithic so mm -hmm. there's something about when you start claiming land and um, farming that just has a tendency of generating more violence. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we know that <laughs> that story quite well <laughs> yeah. over here on this continent. <laughs> and I think we can uh, we can see it uh, even now today, uh, especially here on the continent where people start claiming lands and things just get go horribly horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. People That's are true. bastards. People mm. are assholes. It's it's a thing. 
there we go let's let's wrap this up <laughs> this was uh this is a lot of fun um so the the shield guy from all the previous episodes now has a a name <laughs> and a face attached to him as well <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <The title. it. laughs> um Rolf, thank you thank you very much for, for taking the time to come and talk to us do you is there anything you want to shout out or plug or point anybody in a certain direction to to read anything you do i don't know how much you want people to follow you on instagram or not yeah uh well i i can mention that we have a uh, facebook page uh for the society for combat archaeology uh where we have okay, also, joining that where we have a whole <laughs> uh, photo album also about uh shield reconstructions and lots of data on original finds uh, from various members um so frequent updates there uh, you can go visit that if cool. only i'd known about that when i made my shield <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't fucking wear like 25 kilos or whatever it is uh mateus where can people find you well you can always find me on instagram just Type in my name, it's just Norvig, and you'll find me there. Of course, you can also find me here on this podcast in our special episodes for Patreon supporters, where I, I do the Q and A's and also all the other. Um, we, we, we're going to resume story time, right, Dan? Yes, um, yes. Jonas, Jonas is back next week. How wonderful! Week. I've, I've been missing him. So you can, of yes. course, also get access to the story time um and a lot of other fun extra material in different ways so uh, don't forget to basically spend the amount of money that it that it costs to buy me a cup of coffee to ask me questions once in a while that's it yeah, yeah. so after, after this show we're going to do a q a where anyone who's posts on patreon gets to ask you any question and you have to give them a detailed answer. Uh, <laughs> any, so, question? Any, any question is how I advertise it. So you better deliver. <laughs> um, you can spot, yeah, follow us on Patreon, our Not a Mythology podcast on Instagram, Facebook, um, YouTube channel, and just leave us a five star rating and a positive review. It helps us kind of bump up the charts. And other than that, just keep keep listening. We we appreciate it, and it's. Uh, uh, and I promise I'll work on my my sales speech for the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the extra shows for the Patreon supporters. <laughs> no, it's all right. I got you. I got you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks for having me on the show. No problem. We'll let you know when it's when it's out as well. That sounds great. <laughs>